So in, in early 2018, the Secretary of Defense released a new national defense strategy. And that strategy now calls or now identifies the fact that the United States has entered into a period of what it refers to as great power competition with competitors such as Russia and China. And it's very clear-eyed in its assessment that these two competitors are really directly starting to counter some of the activities that the United States has been taking and our goodwill for the rest of the globe. And as part of that strategy, it says that the military needs to identify our competitive advantage that we need to maintain to ensure that we can deter those adversaries from ever trying to go into a conflict with us, or if we do end up in a military conflict, to ensure that we can dominate that conflict and end it quickly. And so as part of that, what we have been working on here is thinking about how will we train our students here at the 560th and the 99th Flying Training Squadron. Are we producing students and instructors that can train the next generation of fighter and bomber pilots to ensure that competitive advantage if we get ourselves into that fight. And as we looked at it, we said, we think we're training great students for the previous fight, but we don't think that right now, before we started doing this, that we were training them for that next fight that, that could happen in the future and ensuring that they can dominate inside of a peer level conflict. And so it was that initial idea that caused us to relook at all of our peak training paradigms and to ask ourselves, how have we been training in the past? And how, if we could rebuild this from the ground up, how could we train better in the future to ensure that we have the best trained instructors and the best trained fighter and bomber pilots that the world's ever seen? And so to do that, we started off by looking at our training paradigms. And we said, under the previous paradigm, which has really been around since the 1960s, we, what currently, we expect the students that get here to study some before they arrive, and then to maybe do one of the simulators, the traditional legacy simulators that we still operate today. But then after that, they get their first flight with just a very low level of training. And the majority of our training happens in the aircraft. And so they have multiple flights to try to get them up to a level of proficiency where they're safe to operate the aircraft, and then where eventually they can instruct in that same aircraft. Well, this level of training in a flight environment is very inefficient because we're asking them with very little knowledge of what they're doing to go out and put everything together in a flight environment. And that flight environment has weather, it has other aircraft, it has air traffic control that's telling them what to do. And to put all that together can be very, very overwhelming for a pilot. Those of us that have been flying for a while have many recollections of the feelings, the first couple of flights that we had, or the first time that a new skill was introduced. It is overwhelming to go into that environment if you haven't seen it beforehand, if you haven't seen what it looks like, and you haven't practiced through the stick and rudder skills to be able to make it happen. And so we, we thought, what if we challenge that paradigm? What if we shift that paradigm? And so you can see the previous paradigm here, our new paradigm, which we're calling PIT Next, or Pilot Instructor Training Next. It, it incorporates a lot of emerging technologies, and instead of just kind of piecing them on and tweaking our approach, it dramatically changes how we're training these pilots to make them a lot better. It involves still that traditional study that they would have done, but now we incorporate what we're calling immersive ground training. And that's this right here. This is, that's 360 degree videos. They can put on a virtual reality headset and see the flight environment. And they can hear an instructor talking to them. We have overlays where it, they point out the ground references. It talks about the things that they should be looking at, the things that they should be doing. But we don't have them just do it once. We have them do it 10 to 15 times so that they have seen that environment through a deep repetition method. They have seen that environment many, many times. And then from there, we don't just send them to the aircraft. We then send them into this, the virtual reality simulators that we've built up over the last six weeks. And then it allows them to actually practice those same maneuvers that they've seen, but they don't just practice them once or twice. They practice them 10, 20, 30 times. So that the first time that they fly, their proficiency is certainly much higher than it ever was before. It's not the same as flying the aircraft, but we've been able to do the building block approach and build those skills, give them those habit patterns, so that now when they get to the aircraft, we can increase that proficiency much more than it ever was before. We can do it probably with potentially with less flights, so we can use those flights that are remaining to get their proficiency even higher than it was and to bring them up to the level of instruction that we've never been able to do in the past. And that's kind of the genesis of, of what happened here and what we're doing. We're moving very, very rapidly though. So we're, we, are, we are learning as we're going. We're developing as we, we are going. Rather than having a, a two-year plan and research study to figure out what we need to do, we're just executing. Because at the squadron level, we have been empowered by our senior leaders in the Air Force to take some risk and to figure out how we can find that competitive advantage. And this is the result of that. It's just amazing, innovative airmen that are figuring out how to be able to do that.
Tell me a little bit about the, the timetable. How, how, how long ago the genesis of, of this technology was brought here and how quickly we got to where we are today. So this room, about eight weeks ago, was an old office room with a couple old desks in it. And so this, over the course of about eight weeks, we went from getting the 360 degree goggles and videos recorded to within about, I'd say four to five weeks, we had a full complement of virtual reality simulators in here. And it's happened because it's a grassroots bottom up effort. And so it's allowed us to use some of the local local sources to be able to acquire some computers, to be able to acquire the technology that exists here in the San Antonio and the Austin area, to be able to bring all this together. And so in eight weeks, we actually went from nothing to having a, the first complement of four students that successfully competed their rear cockpit check rides in a T-38 and did it much more quickly than they had ever, ever done before and with a higher level of efficiency than they had done before as well. Describe to me cost of these systems versus the cost of a traditional simulator. So these, this system here costs about $4,000 to put everything together. A traditional simulator is somewhere on the order of $1.5 million. So we can literally get hundreds of these simulators for the same for that cost of those other traditional simulators. Now those traditional simulators still serve a great purpose. They have a level of fidelity of instrumentation that we can't quite reach in this yet. But what we can do in this is I can actually take an instructor, I can put an instructor in the next seat over, and in the virtual world, that instructor can be sitting in the rear cockpit behind the student, and the instructor can put the student in dangerous situations in this virtual world to see if the student can recognize those situations and successfully recover from them. So we can get a higher level of safety than we've ever gotten in the past. And it also allows us to be able to link up all four of these systems or the systems that exist over in the 99th on the other side of the building or really across the Air Force, we can link these up and fly a large force exercise. We can have the actual tra students training in an actual traffic pattern. And really the sky's the limit when it comes to the things that we can do to take this level of training and bring it not just beyond this with student pilots, but really across the Air Force. What, what is your vision as to how, how expansive this technology could be across the Air Force? Well, I, so I, I think back through myself as a Strike Eagle F-15E pilot. That's what I've done for the last uh, decade or so. When I first was flying some of the more complex maneuvers in an F-15, such as aerial combat maneuver in ACM, the first time I flew that where you have two friendly aircraft and one enemy aircraft back behind you, I, the first time I ever saw it was in the aircraft. And I was not great at it because I had read about it in a book, I had heard about it in a briefing, but that was it. And it took me several flights before my level of proficiency wasn't all the way to proficient, but just barely above not great. And that's, and that's really the paradigm that we're operating under right now. Well, if we took this kind of training and you applied it across the board in the Air Force, whether it's in fighters or bombers or mobility aircraft, and you could increase the level of proficiency of the students far beyond what they're at right now, and you could do it on an ongoing basis, you could potentially bring more students through the training pipeline, you would increase the, their proficiency and really find that competitive advantage that we need to be able to dominate against an adversary in a peer level conflict. Back to this chart for just one moment. It, it, I'm noticing the difference in proficiency and how proficiency declines in the, in the previous model, yet it stays pretty high in the, in the new model. Explain to me why that is. Talk, just talk about the profi proficiency differential. Absolutely. So it, it's very similar to the first time you ever drove a car. It's the first time you drove a car and you were, and you were approaching a stoplight intersection. You had to think about everything that was going on. It, it took you a long time to be able to analyze it. You drove very slowly. You made sure you knew exactly what you're doing, and it was a very effortful and conscious thing that you did. Well, after you've been driving a car for six months or nine months, you don't have to really think about it anymore. You don't have to think about it when you approach that intersection. You know what to do to go through it. And so your proficiency at driving a car really stays flat. But the way that you got there, the way that you got to the point where you don't have to think about it was through many, many repetitions of approaching an intersection or entering an on-ramp or staying in your lane when you're driving. Well, so that, that is what this new model gives us, is that we are, we are using through what we're calling deep repetition. We are showing the students the environments, that same way as you drove a car, we're showing them the flight environment and we're showing it to them 10, 30, 40, 50 times over and allowing them to get that deep repetition that just like when you drive a car, you, you're eventually your proficiency doesn't drop off at all. You could go without driving a car for a month and not have a problem. With that stiff repetition, we think that we'll be able to retain that proficiency much longer than we were able to in the past. When before, they only saw two to three examples of it, so their proficiency is gonna drop off pretty quickly. 
And that's really the thought that goes behind this repetition and why we think this will be effective. What I'm looking for now is something that we might use. We're, I'm going to have each of you kind of, I'm looking for maybe a closing thought, kind, kind of a closing sound bite sure. to the piece, and then in the editing room we're going to figure it out. Kind, kind of looking big picture, kind, kind of a big picture look to the technology here today and what you're working on. How, how is that ultimately going to make pilots better? How is that ultimately going to make the Air Force better? And how is that ultimately going to protect our country more? Great. So we've been given clear guidance by the Secretary of Defense and the National Defense Strategy, by the Secretary of the Air Force, by the Commander of Air Education and Training Command, to find the competitive advantage that we need to ensure that we can deter an adversary, a peer-level adversary, from fighting us, and if we have to fight, to ensure that we can dominate against that adversary. And incorporating this level of technology, incorporating deep repetition learning, and allowing these students to, to be able to see the flight environment so many more times over than they have in the past can allow us, we think, to find that much higher level of proficiency so that when they go off and they become the next generation of fighter and bomber and mobility pilots, it allows them to be able to potentially fight in a way that they had never been able to fight before, to be able to achieve a level of proficiency and really a level of combat air power capability that they've never been able to do before. And that's exactly what we've been asked to do by our senior leadership. So it's a very exciting time to be in the Air Force to be able to do this. Outstanding. But what I might have you do since Sergio is set up here, Thompson, and what he is doing is he's actually taking off a T-38C in this virtual reality environment right now. And what the, the unique thing about this, instead of this just being a, a regular computer screen, He's got a stereoscopic depth perception that's allowing him to see depth, that's allowing him, he could actually lean forward and get closer to his instrument panel. If he's flying the aircraft from the rear cockpit here, he can look to the left and the right of the seat in front of him so he can learn exactly what this is gonna look like when he's actually in the flight environment. So he's got a, the, a, the, a stick that allows him to replicate what the, the stick in the aircraft feels like, throttles that, that do the same thing. And then he's also got auditory cues that he's getting through the headset that's giving him indication there's an artificial intelligence teaching a tool that comes with this that we've been able to use now so that, that without even having an instructor, a human instructor sometimes behind him, it's allowing him to hear directions from, that, from this artificial intelligence instructor and allowing him to be able to train with that. He also then has available to him a set of virtual reality goggles that only cost about $250. And on here, it allows him to take 360 degree videos, which we have shot in the aircraft, and then we've video edited to be able to put an instructor in there that talks to him as he goes through it. It allows him to look to both directions and see visual references. We've actually pointed out those visual references on the ground so he can see what those look like in that flight environment. And then we've also issued to students now just a $25 Google Cardboard level piece of equipment that they can put their phone in so that when they're at home, they can get access to a private YouTube channel and now see that same flight environment when they're just at home anytime if they want to do more learning there. We've incorporated a lot of uh, commercial off-the-shelf capabilities, such as iPads, that allow us to go in here and I can actually control his flight environment. If I want to drop the weather down on him and see how he reacts to that situation, I can do that with the iPad. I can slew him around in this virtual world. And then I can see where, if I link all these different simulators together, I can see where they're at, they're at relative to each other inside this virtual world as well. So there's a lot of technology that's out there. It's available here in the local area that we've been able to bring into this uh, to make this more effective training. That's great. Uh, finally, anything that I haven't asked or anything that, that occurs to you, and you've given us plenty, so I'm, I'm just putting this out there in case something else occurs to you that you want to add to what we what we just talked about. The one thing I would say is that to do this level of bottom-up innovation, what we found is we had to rethink how an Air Force squadron is even organized. Because we were traditionally organized to be able to take very directive, top-down guidance, and then to be able to translate that into daily flight schedule. Well now, what we are finding is that with the authorities that we've been given from higher headquarters, we are the ones that are kind of developing and iterating on the capabilities and adapting to the mission at the speed of the mission, at the you speed of relevance. But to do that required us to restructure our squadron. So now we're, rather than being restructured in flights that just manage students, now we're restructured into a set of network teams in our squadron. We've reorganized into four network teams, a development team, an implementation team, a validation team to kind of look at this with a black hat perspective or a red team perspective and then an execution team that actually goes out and does the flying mission, does the simulation mission. And that's allowing us to be able to adapt very rapidly with a time horizon of hours and days rather than the traditional time horizon of months and weeks. And it's allowing us to be able to find the tools to be able to bring this together and then to be able to report up the chain to our higher headquarters what this, what this looks like and how effective it's been. Super. Thank you.